Hi, I'm Christy Shriver, and we're here to discuss books that have changed the world and have changed us. And I'm Gary Shriver, and this is the How to Love Lit podcast. This is our second episode in our four-part series discussing the great Nigerian work, Things Fall Apart, and its author, Chinua Achebe. Last week, we looked at the historical context of Nigerian history pre-colonial up to the colonial period. Uh, we looked, albeit briefly, uh, at the life of Achebe himself, how the book got published, and a little bit about the poem that it even inspired the title. We also introduced the great tragic hero of the novel, Okonkwo. Okonkwo. <laughs> and today we're going to continue exploring Igbo land as we look at some of the cultural traditions that are important to the story. We're going to look at a, a little bit of the structure of the book, and hopefully we'll discuss all the way through Chapter 7. Did I miss anything, Christy? I think that's it. That's a lot, though. But you never know. Sometimes we go down some tangents. There's so many things we could talk about that would be culturally relevant to understanding the work. I heard Dr. Achebe do a question and answer session uh, for the BBC one time, and a girl asked a question that stood out to me. She, her question was something like this, and I'll paraphrase it as best I can. She was saying, I'm an aspiring writer, and it's obvious that you have written a story about the unique particulars of your culture, but you also wrote about universal things that apply to all people. And she looked at him, and of course this is true, and she said, I know how to write about my own experiences, but how do I make them universal? And his answer, I looked at that too, was interesting to me, and I was ready for it. I was going to write it down. Here's a tip. I want to do that. <laughs> And he looked at her and he said this, and again, I paraphrase because I can't remember it, but I just remember, you know, the idea of what he said. He said, you can't, <laughs> huh. you, you can only write about your reality. And if it takes on universal qualities, it's because, you know, the work is greater than you and it takes on a life of its own. So the poor little girl like me were disappointed because we didn't get the formula for writing the great, you right. know, earth novel. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure she was, but but haven't we talked about this often before? And, and of course, musicians are the same way. I mean, a writer writes about what they know. And somehow I, as a reader or a listener, can identify with him or her. And, um, you know, their reality touches me, although the setting may be totally different. Somehow their world is also my reality. And that is the art. Well, it really is. And it's what Achebe wanted to communicate more than anything. The story of the Ibu people is a human story. The reality of us all is present in Ibo land. The relationships in the fictional Ibo community of Umofia and Mabanta between two groups, they may have different pigmentation than other people from planet Earth. There may be relationships between the genders, uh, but... They're still individuals, and these things are complex. And that is really one of the great advantages of novels, as opposed to just giving a lecture series on culture or history. Through novelistic discourse, an author is not just relating to us information about a place or explaining cultural norms, rules, models, political orders, social orders, we are getting someone's unique perspective on them, of course, but we're also getting a different kind of understanding. One example that makes me wonder, you know, when I think about this particular book is what would it be like if you're living or born in a polygamous society? I mean, the gender politics in this book are clearly and unapologetically masculine. Achebe doesn't apologize for that. He's not sanctioning polygamy as a preferred mode of existence, but it's the reality of the culture. The story is set in this culture and it's told in this third person omniscient, almost most of the time, although not always detached narrator. These are the, the way that things are. And then we understand them as such. Well, in the case of the Evo people specifically, I mean, it was important to Achebe for the world to understand the unique and the deep cultural roots inherent in the way of life in this part of the world. And this is what the Europeans refused to see and, and refused to understand when they arrived in Africa. I mean, the people of this land were not savages simply because they didn't live or speak like European peoples. Uh, there was a culture 
a deep culture with a complex religious tradition, uh, moral values and social structures and political structures and uh, meaningful recorded histories. And as is so often the case with highly educated people, even today, there was an arrogance of superiority to which <laughs> Achebe is going to respond. Just because you don't see or understand something doesn't mean you are not looking straight at it. Goodness, don't we all totally understand that? You know, I remember my first teaching job right after college. I had a, it's not as similar cultural experience as, as what Achebe is referring to, but it's as close as I can get. Uh, I moved to Japan and I was teaching English uh, mostly to businessmen for a company. The company's name was Interact, and I lived in this town named Shizuoka. If, if you're over there, maybe you know it. Anyway, after I first moved there, I looked around, and they had a Kentucky Fried Chicken. There was a mall. I saw Denny's. They drank Coca-Cola. And I remember thinking, wow, okay, well, this is exactly like the United States, just different language. I remember thinking that because a year later, I remember looking back and thinking how stupid that thought was. (laughs) The culture of the United States and the culture of Japan are extremely different, and the differences are historical. They're deep, they're multifaceted. And when I left Japan after living there one year, but only one year, I remember thinking in somewhat kind of this sad thing that the only thing I really understood about Japan is that I didn't know anything. I was just beginning to learn something of that culture. Uh, The main lesson, really, if you want to be honest, that I learned over there was humility, (laughs) I learned that so often I could look at something and I didn't know what I was seeing. When I had entered classrooms at Mitsubishi or Pioneer, which were the companies I worked at, I saw men and women interact with each other and I misjudged the dynamics of those groups so often. When I had bowed to elders, I had done it wrong and I misrepresented myself. When I spoke, I'd misused words. I'd accidentally disrespected people I was trying to honor. I was seeing things in people, but I often lacked the lens of cultural understanding to understand what I was in seeing and therefore engage appropriately. And that is what Achebe wanted to do for Nigeria in particular, but in some sense for all of Africa. Yes, he's deliberate in that he wants to give us a lens of cultural understanding The metaphor would be really just a good pair of glasses so that you can see clearer and understand the blurry images that you're looking at. Well, we mentioned uh, that Joseph Conrad was the one who really inspired him to write his first book. Um, If inspiration (laughs) is the right word. Yeah, I don't know if it is. Right. Uh, A a good place to start today, uh, before we get into the text, I think is to start with Conrad's famous book, Heart of Darkness, um, as a Chebe's piece. Um, you know, an image of Africa, racism in Conrad's heart of darkness. Um, in some ways, it's his rebuttal to it. And uh, I'm familiar with Conrad's book, as many of us are, but I haven't read it myself yet. <laughs> sure. Uh, lots of people, you know, Spark noted that thing. It's no simple <laughs> read. <laughs> but in 1899, uh, yeah, Joseph Conrad wrote a book. Uh, it's since been considered one of the greatest works in the Western canon. So sure, one day we'll may do it, but it's inspired great artists like Ernest Hemingway and actually people like Francis Ford Coppola. And, you know, it's even alluded to in the popular TV series Lost. Anyone who is serious about English language literature is probably going to be required to read it at some point during your education. It explores colonization, imperialism for sure, but it's not really just a political book. It explores things like alienation and moral corruption, But the reason that it caught Achebe's eye specifically is because it takes place in the Belgian Congo. Well, and I do want to point out that the Belgian Congo is generally considered to be the most notorious European colony in Africa. And it was known particularly for the um, the colonizers' immense greed and brutal treatment of the native people. Exactly. And in uh, the book, Conrad, just like Tolkien, uses this genre of a quest— But in Conrad's book, it's ironic, really, the take on the quest. Uh, And and really, this is an oversimplification because we can't get into his book. But uh, civilization, as the Europeans thought of themselves, they weren't really civilized as they thought they were. 
uh, people, and this is Conrad's point, in their essence are savage and cruel. And even those of us in the most civilized of cultures, uh, the idea being that on an individual level, uh, the heart of man, whoever he is, is deceitful, dark, and unknowable. Hence the title of his book, Heart of Darkness. And I would like to point out, he wrote this book before two world wars. There's your statement on civilization. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> so it doesn't seem that any of these ideas you just mentioned conflict with anything Achebe believes. And um, honestly, they're similar to the ideas and things fall apart. True. And those ideas about alienation and the heart of man, that's not what offended Achebe. It was the idea of making Native Africans the outward representation of savagery that he found offensive. I mean, why does Africa have to be the dark place? Achebe's passion-filled perspective is very interesting to read the whole essay, really, uh, in its full context. Well, I'll, I'll put a link to Achebe's essay on Conrad on our website uh, with the things fall apart listing guides, if anybody wants to read Achebe's full essay. <laughs> yes. Achebe often spoke uh, about his experience and his encounter with reading Conrad's book. I mean, it was really an epiphany for him that inspired his entire career. Because when he read the book the first time, he was a young student. And he identified with the colonizers, and he saw himself as Marlowe, the man on the boat. And he, he references the seductive power, that's his words, of Conrad's writing ability. However, when he read it again as an adult, he looked at it differently. By this point, he, you know, he was a more developed scholar. He was a more critical thinker. And then it struck him, no, I'm not on the boat. I'm one of the savages. I'm African. I'm black. And that's when he made the controversial statement that the book is, and I'm going to quote Achebe here, an offensive and totally deplorable book where Conrad adopted the role of purveyor of comforting myths. Those are Achebe's words. <laughs> <laughs> I can certainly see where he's coming from. Well, of course. Uh, when Achebe reads Conrad, he's offended that Native people are never given a voice. That's what he means. I mean, they literally do not have a voice. They grunt. He sees the local populations as being dehumanized because they are. They're being degraded. They're presented as grotesque, howling mobs. You, know, you can barely see them. You don't even see whole, whole people. You just see parts of them. There's no culture. There's no organizational system. There's no human feeling of any kind. Uh, of course, when I read Heart of Tar Darkness, you know, these are things... When Achebe says these things and you go back and look at the book, it's absolutely undeniable that's the case. But the way you are phrasing all that, it makes me think you want to defend Conrad. Well, I'm not willing to defend him <laughs> because, like I said, I don't think anyone agrees, well, disagrees with Achebe's point. It's not arguable. But it is possible uh, to have another perspective on Conrad's book in general. And, and there's been a lot of discussion about this, obviously, for the past you know, 50, 60 years. Louis Cosi, another black playwright and critic, has an interesting voice, and he generalizes it in a larger context. And he says, well, the conquest of the earth, which mostly means taking away from those who have a different complexion or slightly flatter nose than ourselves, is not a pretty thing when you look into it. In other words, this is a deeper, older, and wider spread problem than just, you know, African colonialism. Human conquest is the story of humanity at large. So it is part of a larger and broader discussion of which Achebe wants to engage. Right, it is. Uh, and in 1899, when Heart of Darkness was published, the world was a really different place than in the 1950s when Achebe was reading it, or even now in, you know, 20, 22, 21, whatever year we're in. <laughs> uh, in. In 1899, barbaric conquests of people were was more visible than how people conquer and control others today. But it's naive to think we've moved past any no, of this. There's your have. arrogance of the yeah. present. Okay. In general, humans just relabel everything using words that we consider more progressive and palatable. But the same thing still exists. Oh, no question. No doubt. Uh, although there's a lot of evidence to support uh, that Comrade, you know, at his time, he considered himself progressive and liberal. You know, today, from our perspective, he doesn't look that way at all. I mean, we probably would call him a racist and anti-Semite. I'm for sure he probably was a chauvinist. 
if we just want to name call, you know, you could name call. He's not here to defend himself all day long. Uh, but Achabe had a reason for doing that. And so when he calls Conrad a bloody racist, he has a reason for doing so. <laughs> As I have said many, many times, uh, it is the arrogance of the present that really dares us to think that uh, we are any different or especially more evolved than people of the past and that we're above any of this. And it's certainly self-righteous to try to, to censor others you know, as morally inferior. But what's so great about Achebe's name-calling is that it serves a larger purpose. I mean, he's not asserting personal superiority uh, he name calls to draw attention to a conversation he wants to have and feels the world should have. And he is in no way wanting to cancel Conrad. He's trying to do exactly the opposite. He's trying to engage him directly, which I love. And Achebe's famous essay about Conrad sparked an amazing historical conversation, uh, one that's important to have. And it never called for censorship of Conrad at all. And today, the books are read together. <laughs> that's Incredible difference than, you know, social media exchanges that we see today. But, you know, that's, I guess, a different it conversation. It goes back to the rule, you <laughs> just have to have a better idea. Yeah, uh, and, and Achebe did. And another reason I want to consider Achebe's perspective on Heart of Darkness uh, is where I want to start when we engage the book today. Because no matter how you feel about Conrad's personal attitudes toward Native people, whether you think he was or wasn't a bloody racist, to use Achebe's term, what Conrad writes as he describes what his characters thought as they floated down the Congo River is most definitely an entirely plausible understanding of what a British traveler to the Congo would see and think in the year 1890. So whether it's Conrad's personal views or just the views of his character that he's trying to portray, you know, that's a different conversation, but the descriptions are realistic the Europeans did see and interpret Africa through these very superior European lenses from their minds. And what Conrad inspired Echebe to do was to give voice to those natives in Conrad's books who were being portrayed with grunts and howls. The Europeans didn't understand their words, so they just interpreted them as grunts. The Europeans didn't understand the rites of passage of the culture, the societal organizations that existed in Africa. So they assumed that there was no civilization. What Echebe does and things fall apart is demonstrate the cultural equivalencies. And that is what I want us to be able to notice as we read the book. Echebe is saying, you know how Europeans conduct justice? Well, we conduct justice, but this is how we conduct justice. You know how Europeans arrange marriages? This is how we arrange marriages. You know how Europeans live in community? This is how we live in community. You know how Europeans worship God? This is how we worship God. What Echebe wants to do is open the eyes of the world. He's focused on Europe, but it was for the world. And really to demonstrate the complexity and order of these rural societies that were apparently very mysterious <laughs> to Conrad in 1890. For sure. It's, all, it's also important that Achebe does not reduce Africa and Europe to a binary opposition. Exactly. Uh, he never tries to make the case that Africa is all good and Europe is all bad. Uh, there are men who beat their wives in Africa just like there are in Britain. Uh, there are men who get depressed when their lives unravel in Africa just like there are in England. And, um, you know, there are corrupt Europeans. There are corrupt Africans. There are missionaries that are good people. Uh, there are others that are ignorant. There are Africans that are wise people, but there are Africans that are fools as well. In other words, life everywhere on this planet. <laughs> Right, you're right, and that's different. You know, when we saw Tolkien, he did construct binaries. We have orcs that are good versus hobbits. I mean, orcs, they're not good, they're bad. Hobbits are good. But that's clearly a binary construct. Well, Unconquo is not that person. Unconquo is a character that's extremely complex. He's great, but he's flawed. Things Fall Apart is not romanticized. It's not a parable. I would argue that both Heart of Darkness and Things Fall Apart are paradoxical in some of the same ways. And they make, they do, they really do make some of the same arguments. In Heart of Darkness, Mr. Kurtz, the white colonizer, 
is actually a genius. Maybe he would have been a great musician or a political leader, but in the jungle, by the end of the book, he's full of sheer inhumanity and he screams out, exterminate all the brutes. In some sense, he's hollow, but also full. He has no moral background, and so he disintegrates. And things fall apart. Akanko is a brave warrior, but he's been driven by fear. He could have been, and he was at one point, a revered leader in his tribe. That's what he always wanted, but he's unable to adapt. So he's also hollow and full, but in a different way. We can admire Akanko, but we can also pity him. He wants so much to be the epitome of manliness, but ironically, he's going to commit a female crime. What Conrad does is to show how European values are subverted by African energies, which is an interesting thing to point out, but Achebe shows how Africa is subverted by European energies. Both writers end up talking about man's inhumanity to man. I'm not sure I'd recommend either book for elementary or middle school children to read uh, because they lay out some complicated moral issues that are really uh, further complicated. One, because they cross cultures. And two, uh, because no culture is morally perfect in any sort of, um, you know, universally accepted sense. And not even murder is universally wrong in all cultures and all circumstances. Right. It, and you're right. It's probably not for the elementary age children. <laughs> uh, so Achebe introduces Igbo culture in its complexities. And one of the fun parts of the book for me really has been learning about the culture. In this story, you know, we get to be Ibu. We're inside the culture, even if we're learning about it for the first time. And his narrative style with this, you know, ambiguous third person narrator positions us inside the clan. We are not outside Europeans. So let's get into some of that Ibu culture. (laughs) In terms of culture, uh, I thought it was fun that Achebe starts with sports. (laughs) Competitive Missouri boy, I mean, like that. Uh, wrestling is to Ebo land what football is to the Midwest. So be it American football or even traditional football, how about manhood and hierarchy is established through sports? <laughs> how about that as a theme? I guess, well, you know, Achebe may have another reason to talk about it that way. We may get that later on in, our, in another episode, but true, sports is sports. <laughs> but more importantly than that, uh, we should notice that unlike Conrad's European observer, who couldn't understand anything he saw, we should immediately observe and understand that in Igbo society, uh, there's also a very defined social structure. I mean, uh, the village of Umofia is one of nine villages in a clan. The clan lives in a state of equilibrium and, and relative harmony because of a governance code that the members follow and they enforce. I mean, there's law for you. Uh, there are conflicts with other clans, but they are relatively small scale. Uh, Okonkwo boasts at one point uh, that they lost two men in a war, but the other side lost 12. <laughs> these clashes, however, th- they are important. And how a man performs in these wars really gives him the prestige. And in Okonkwo's case, he has taken several human heads in his career and even drinks from one of them. <laughs> mm. This gives him... Uh, you know, respect as a warrior and uh, village life is run by a merit-based system, not an inheritance-based system. Interesting to point out. And the book states early on that in Igbo culture, you are not judged by your family, but by your own individual accomplishments. And this, of course, is very different than the class system of Britain or other places in Europe, and something European readers would be quick to pay attention to. And this is actually a highly sophisticated way of developing a social structure. And to many of us today, it seems uh, way more fair than some people being positioned in society higher than others because of birth status, status or other forms of unmerited privilege. And I would like to make this comment on colonialization also. You have to keep in mind that the first or or second generation of colonists that went out were basically the hillbillies in their own country. They had never been anywhere. So the idea of a different culture was completely foreign to them because of how uh, provincial they were. 
Well, another thing I noticed pretty early on uh, is the role that gender will play in this book pretty much from beginning uh, to end. Akankwo assesses his own worth through a comparison of his masculinity with his father's. A childhood friend told him his father was Agbala, which we find out is another name for a woman. And of course, that was an insult. It was a bad thing. Prestige and manliness uh, seem to be the same thing, at least for Okonkwo. For Okonkwo, that becomes the entire basis of his fear. It comes down to he doesn't want to look like a girl. And this hyper-masculinism turns out is not a strength. It's going to lead him to behave in ways that we as readers are going to be led to understand it's immoral. But also, it's going to divide him with his son, who isn't interested in this kind of masculinity. It's also important that Achebe leads us to understand that Akonko's drive for extreme masculinity is not a value that is endorsed by the Igbo culture. One of Okonkwo's friends, Obierica, who we're going to learn is very likable and wise, repeatedly counsels Akonkwo to be more balanced. And later on, when Okonkwo is exiled back to his mother's homeland, this lack of feminine balance is specifically referenced and addressed at him. Another uh, very important cultural trait in the Igbo culture that is highlighted is the importance of titles. It becomes obvious over the course of the book how important titles are. And uh, they're actually things that you purchase. And I've read one article that in some ways uh, it was the way that wealth was redistributed. And uh, But the idea is as you get wealthier and wealthier, you can afford to pay for them for the titles. You wear ankle bracelets to show that you have them. And they give you prestige. And, uh, of course, we have all those same things in Western culture as well. We pay for titles. We work for them. And uh, the whole point of them is to give us prestige. And the titles in this book seem strange to us because we're unfamiliar with them. But things like he's the CEO or she's a doctor, that confers status in our world as well. And uh, even things like she's verified on TikTok, (laughs) which I think is... An ironic statement, uh, it, you know, or they have a check mark on Twitter. Uh, or, those are all status symbols in our world that would seem strange and insignificant to outsiders. I don't and, think it'd mean much to the Ibu in those <laughs> days. Right. And of course, we wear our titles in the forms of, um, you know, overpriced purses, overpriced cars, overpriced watches. Uh, you know, all these are ways to denote success. And in Yomofia, there are only four. But the fourth one, the fourth title is so expensive, it's very rare for someone to have all of them. Uh, just to give you a little context of how much a title costs today, one of the titles mentioned in the book is the Ozo title. Uh, I'm not an expert in Igbo culture in any way, but I thought I would Google how much that costs today, and I saw a couple of figures. But one that was a lower title, uh, you know, the, that price was starting at $25,000. Oh. The point I want to make is that uh, ranking and status in Evo society is something that you have control over. I mean, if you want to work hard and establish yourself, and it is not arbitrary, and we will see that in many ways as we go back through the book. Well, what we understand about Okonkwo is that poor Okonkwo had to start at the bottom He is born with no advantages, no privilege of birth. The fact that Akonko's father dies heavily in debt and has no titles is a source of shame. And building up his own status, there's nothing wrong with that. That's a noble goal. Akonko, for the entire book, does try to build himself up in an honorable way following the norms of his society. Another big cultural idea in chapter one that I think is just fun and important, very important, and we're going to see it from the beginning of the book all the way to the end, is the importance of the cola nut. I honestly didn't realize cola, as I read it in the story because it's spelled with a K, had a connection with (laughs) (laughs) Coca-Cola. But cola nuts are important, and and there is a connection, but they're important among all Nigerian people, even among Nigerian people who live in other parts of the world, even today. I saw somewhere where a man says, wherever the Igbo gather, the cola nut is always used as a symbol of brotherhood and togetherness. Cola, of course, is the fruit 
of the Kola tree, which is native to the tropical rainforest uh, of Africa. But as most of us know, one great thing about Kola, caffeine. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. Achebe points out very quickly the role of uh, the Kola in Igbo life. And the Igbo believe that Kola is life. So do we when we have our coffee in the morning. So <laughs> Different reasons. <laughs> yeah, For the Igbo, Kola symbolizes peace. And that's why an Igbo man welcomes others into his home with a Kola nut. And a phrase which translated in English says this, he who brings cola brings peace. Uh, there are actually more than one type of cola, but, you know, <laughs> that's getting into the weeds and maybe a little more than we have time for. I think so. But the important idea is that the cola has a social and even a ceremonial function in the culture. And Achebe demonstrates this throughout the book. Uh, the breaking and eating of the cola nut is something that we want to notice as we go forward through the study. The last big culture point uh, I think we can point out before we actually start talking about the story, because it shows up in so many places, it just, you need to set, explain it on the front end, uh, is the importance of yams. Interestingly enough, when I was first reading a book, my comment to you is, why are they yammering on about yams? <laughs> I know. You had to get to the part where it says it's the king of the crops. Right. Uh, then you can see, even if you know nothing about yams, that they matter. Uh, It serves as a sign of a man's capability to be a provider uh, for his home, his manhood. Unoka, Unkonko's father, is a bad yam farmer, as well as a lazy human being. Probably he's a bad yam farmer because he's a lazy (laughs) human being. And he gets, you know, he gets slammed by the priestess who tells him to go home and work like a man. We can also see that um, it's a path to wealth. But before we understand, you know, well, even if we do understand the symbolic importance of a yam, we may need to understand uh, what it actually is. Is it the same thing as a sweet potato? Like (laughs) I have a cracker barrel? Oh, my gosh. (laughs) Well, not exactly. I mean, yams are a tuber kind of like a potato or uh, a sweet potato, but they have a different texture and they're different in other ways as well. But, you know, that's a good way to think of them if you have never seen one and uh, they are a primary agricultural commodity across a lot of West and Central Africa. But honestly, and you can see this in the store as well, they are really very labor intensive to cultivate even to this day. And they're planted between February and April and they're harvested uh, 180 to 270 days later in August or September. And they can get very large and the stages of their growth actually marks the calendar. And if you look at pictures from various yam festivals, which you can attend across Africa, you'll see uh, some of those yams. You can even get up to 100 pounds. And yam festivals, uh, like we see in Things Fall Apart, are still a big part of Nigerian culture today. And uh, Christy, if you don't mind, read this quote from Things Fall Apart. I think it demonstrates the celebratory nature of the festival and kind of reminds me of what we do around here on Thanksgiving and Christmas. The pounded yam dish placed in front of the partakers of the festival was as big as a mountain. People had to eat their way through it all night. It was only during the following day when the pounded yam mountain had gone down that people on one side recognized and greeted their family members on the other side of the dish for the first time. (laughs) That is a lot of sitting and eating to do that. I mean, you can see a lot of effort and energy associated with the festival and uh, children go through cleaning rituals and the streets are fixed up and uh, guests come in, dances are prepared. And it's religious because its purpose is spiritual, but the spirituality is really just one part of it. And it does serve to thank the gods for the harvest, but it's also designed to express gratitude to all of society for their part friends and family as well as the ancestors and it's um, also important to note what the goddess Ani who is the earth goddess is also the judge of morality and conduct and again if we want to make a cultural comparison to try to understand here in our religious communities we do the same thing at Christmas I mean you know we thank God who also administers moral authority over our lives but it's you know it's also about family and friends and of course and things fall apart As we've mentioned, yams clearly symbolize success, wealth, power. The more barns you have that contain rams, the richer you are. If you're a great man, you can feed your family from harvest to the next on yams. 
Okonkwo wanted to be a great man, so when his father died, he went to another man, a successful man, for a job. And we're going to read that part. And now that we understand a little bit about yams, a little bit about cola nuts, maybe we can understand a little more about the cultural context of this exchange. Uh, These men are going to sit down. They're going to drink palm wine. I think drinking wine together is a universal symbol of bonding, <laughs> bonding no matter where yeah. you live, and, and we understand it. But the other things are, are a little bit more contextual, and, you know, we needed kind of some of that orientation uh, to figure them out. There was a wealthy man in Conquo's village who had three huge barns, nine wives, and 30 children. His name was Nakibi, and he had taken the highest but one title which a man could take in the clan. It was for this man that Aconqua worked to earn his first seed yams. He took a pot of palm wine and a cock to Wakibi. Two elderly neighbors were sent for, and Wakibi's two grown-up sons were also present in his obi. He presented a cola nut and an alligator pepper, which were passed around for all to see and then returned to him. He broke the nut, saying, We shall all live. We pray for life, children, a good harvest, and happiness. You will have what is good for you, and I will have what is good for me. Let the kite perch and let the eagle perch too. If one says no to the other, let his wing break. After the cola nut had been eaten, Hakonquo brought his palm wine from the corner of the hut where it had been placed and stood it in the center of the group. He addressed Nakibi and called him our father. Naaye, he said, I have brought you this little cola, as our people say, a man who pays respect to the great paves the way for his own greatness. I have come to pay you my respects, but also ask a favor. But let us drink the wine first. Everybody thanked Aconquo, and the neighbors brought out their drinking horns from the goatskins bags that they carried. Nakibi brought down his own horn, which was fastened to the rafters. The younger of his sons, who was also the youngest in the group, moved to the center, raised the pot on his left knee, and began to pour out the wine. The first cup went to Aconquo, who must taste his wine before anyone else. Then the group drank, beginning with the eldest man. When everyone had drunk two or three horns, Bakiwi sent for his wives. Some of them were not at home, but only four came. And, of course, we're going to see that there's this long exchange. They're going to talk. They're going to drink together. Uh, you know, conversation, we'll see, uh, happens for a while. But then we're going to get to this part. After the wine had been drunk, Akonkwo laid his difficulties before Nuakibi. I've come to you for help, he said. Perhaps you can already guess what it is. I have cleared a farm but have no yams to sow. I know what it is to ask a man to trust another with his yams, especially these days when young men are afraid of hard work, but I am not afraid of work. The lizard that jumped from the high Oroko tree to the ground said he would praise himself if no one else did. I began to fend for myself at an age when most people still suck at their mother's breasts. If you give me some yam seeds, I shall not fail you. Nikibi cleared his throat. It pleases me to see a young man like you these days when our youth have gone so soft. Many young men have come to me to ask for yams, but I have refused because I knew they would not dump they would dump them in the earth and leave them to be choked by weeds. When I say no to them, they think I'm hard hearted, but it is not so. Iniki the bird says that since men have learned to shoot without missing, he has learned to fly without perching. I have learned to be stingy with my yams, but I can trust you. I know it as I look at you. As our father said, you can tell a ripe corn by its look. I shall give you twice 400 yams. Go ahead and prepare your farm. That's how he started his career. You know, to quote an Ibu proverb from the book, if a child washed his hands, he could eat with kings. And in other words, if a person works hard, he can be successful. And that is one of the core values of Ibu culture, hard work. Another value of Igbo culture that we see is the art of conversation. And I think it's interesting that Achebe, even though he writes a short book, he spends three pages on this one conversation. I know, and I probably shouldn't have clipped through it as fast as I did. But to quote another Igbo proverb, and this is quoted also several times in the book, proverbs are the palm oil with which words are eaten and the art of conversation And then later on of oratory are extremely important values in this society. Ironically, something Joseph Conrad's characters completely misunderstood. Chebe once said in an interview that 
proverbs are both utilitarian, but they're also vignettes of art. And this novel puts all of that on display. And you can see it's basically on every page. Achebe tries to write in English, and I find this so fascinating. But he uses the writing phrases and ways of expression of the Ibu speech patterns. This is super complicated to do. What he's trying to do is use the English language, but strip it of the cultural context of the British or American cultures or the cultures of the colonizers. He wants to take away idioms or anything that would be foreign to the African context. How how is that possible and still be able to create meaning? Well, it's a challenge for sure. But by using African idioms, like we just read, and proverbs, he's able to do that. They're an important tool. And all these proverbs in the text, they don't just serve to give local color or to move the story along, but it helps us understand the Ibu logic. Those of us who speak English or don't understand that worldview are allowed to see it from the inside, and it's pretty incredible. Although they feel simple, they're very intentional, and he was very intentional when he included them. Another thing that Proverbs do for me uh, is to help me understand why things are important to the Ibu. Exactly. Uh, it's through the Proverbs that we see that for the Ibu people, the most important values are things like generosity and uh, duality and reciprocity and humility and uh, industry and tolerance. And I know I'm going to talk about this when we talk about the columns, but it's interesting uh, that because I've read so many Proverbs at the beginning of the novel, I totally understand how these clashes and values leave the Ibu people at a disadvantage when dealing later with the British, who in many ways take advantage of these values without reciprocating them. Absolutely. And there's a whole lot more we could say about culture. And obviously, we're going to talk about culture every episode. Uh, We definitely next week are going to feature religion. We'll talk a little bit more about the polygamy. But let's shift gears because we do want to talk about Okonkwo. Well, he kind of dominates the novel, no doubt. Yeah, he is the story. I mean, he's such a complex human being. Okonkwo isn't a superhero, and he's really, in some ways, not exceptional. I don't even think he's likable. Okonkwo is a flawed hero. He wrestles with issues with his father. He wrestles with being a father. He's relatable. All of us have something to identify with Okonkwo. Maybe we know him. Maybe we are him. Maybe a part of us is. Very archetypal. Mm -hmm. Okonkwo is is such an interesting person, and it's kind of surprising that Achebe was bold enough to make his hero so flawed uh, when in some ways he wanted to demonstrate what was good about his home culture. I like understanding that Okonkwo is not held up um, as this archetypal image of what a perfect Ibu man is supposed to be. And uh, Achebe painted the portrait of a flawed man, not an ideal one. That's important. It's very important. And although in some important ways he does meet the criteria of being a great man, he's self-made, he's a warrior, he's very dutiful to his community, he has integrity. Uh, There's certainly no one more hardworking working in a conquo, but it's the other things about him, which of course ultimately are going to make the story tragic. I mean, a conquo is rash. He's impulsive. He's excessive. And uh, for a culture that is so bent on balance, there isn't a lot of balance with a conquo. He's over the top in many ways, not just one way. True. And a lot of what he's over the top about is negative. At least to me, he's too rageful. And, of course, we see this early on in Chapter 2. Aconquo ruled his household with a heavy hand. His wives, especially the youngest, lived in perpetual fear of his fiery temper, and so did his little children. Perhaps down in his heart, Aconquo was not a cruel man. But his whole life was dominated by fear, the fear of failure and of weakness. It was deeper and more intimate than the fear of evil and capricious gods and of magic, the fear of the forest and the forces of nature, malevolent, red in tooth and claw. Okonkwo's fear was greater than these. It was not external, but lay deep within himself. It was the fear of himself, lest he should be found to resemble his father. And of course, it makes him rageful. 
But then again, in chapter four, we see this come out again. Akanko was provoked to justifiable anger by his youngest wife, who went to plate her hair at her friend's house and did not return early to cook the afternoon meal. Akanko did not know at first that she was not home. After waiting in vain for her dish, she went to her hut to see what she was doing. There was nobody in the hut, and the fireplace was cold. Where is Ojiogo? he asked his second wife, who came out of her hut to draw water from a gigantic pot in the shade of a small tree in the middle of the compound. She's gone to plait her hair. Okonkwo bit his lips as anger welled up within him. Where are her children? Did she take them? He asked with unusual coolness and restraint. They're here, answered his first wife, Noe's mother. Okonkwo bent down and looked into her hut. Ojugo's children were eating with the children of his first wife. Did she ask you to feed them before she went? Yes, lied Noe's mother, trying to minimize Ojugo's thoughtlessness. Okonkwo knew she was not speaking the truth. He walked back to his obi to await Ojugo's return. And when she returned, he beat her heavily. In his anger, he had forgotten that it was the week of peace. His first two wives went out in great alarm, pleading with him that it was the sacred week. But Okonkwo was not the man to stop beating somebody halfway through, not even for fear of a goddess. (laughs) Finally, I'm going to read you this last little passage in chapter five. And then the storm burst. Okonkwo, who had been walking about aimlessly in his compound in suppressed anger, suddenly found an outlet. Who killed this banana tree? He asked. A hush fell on the compound immediately. Who killed this tree? Are you all deaf and dumb? As a matter of fact, the tree was very much alive. Okonkwo's second wife had merely cut a few leaves off of it to wrap some food, and she said so. Without further argument, Okonkwo gave her a sound beating and left her and her only daughter weeping. Neither of the other wives dared to interfere beyond an occasional and tentative, It's enough, Okonkwo, pleaded with a reasonable distance. His anger was thus subsided. Okonkwo decided to go out hunting. Okonkwo's flaws would get you in trouble in any culture. (laughs) I mean, he's a warmonger. He's a bully. He worries way too much about whether other people think of him. He's haunted by fear. The characteristic that really stands out to me more than all of these others is that he lives in mortal fear of being feminine. So true. This is one man that doesn't want to be in tune with his feminine side Uh at all. And this may be the one thing more than any other, I know it's debatable, that will ultimately doom him. And we're going to talk about it extensively next episode. But the beginning of chapter one, we find out about an ill-fated character named Ikimafuna. Ikimafuna is a hostage taken from a neighboring clan because of a death his father was directly involved with. Ikimafuna is sent to live in Mofia, and the clan has designated Okonkwo to be his guardian. For three years, he lives as one of the family, and Okonkwo t- treats him as a son, raises him as his own son, Nuowe, who's two years younger than Ikimafuna. Noe and Akimafuna are best friends. Akunkwo, who has never shown any emotion except anger, likes Akimafuna. The text says that Akimafuna calls Akunkwo father. Akimafuna blends well with the family and the whole village. And it seems that this is how things are going to go on interminably. But one year, the Oracle of the Hills and of the Caves pronounced that the clan should kill Akimafuna. Izeldu, who is the oldest man in that part of Mufia, approaches Okonkwo, and he breaks the news that this is what's going to happen, the clan's going to kill the boy. But he told Okonkwo that he himself should have nothing to do with the killing because of his close relationship with the boy. The next day, a group of elders from all nine villages that make up the clan come to Okonkwo. No way and Ikimafuno uh, awake and Okonkwo lies to them to tell them that Akimafuno is going home. This becomes a very pivotal place in the story, so it's important to read. Uh, Gary, let's read what happens as the men take Akimafuno away, and we know it's to be murdered. Thus the men of Umafia pursued their way, armed with sheathed machetes, and Ikimafuno, carrying a pot of palm wine on his head, walked in their midst. Although he had felt uneasy at first, he was not afraid now. Okonkwo walked behind him. He could hardly imagine that Okonkwo was not his real father. 
He had never been fond of his real father, and at the end of three years, he had become very distant indeed. But his mother and his three-year-old sister, uh, of course, she would not be three now, but six. Would he recognize her now? She must have grown quite big. How his mother would weep for joy and thank Okonkwo for having looked after him so well and for bringing him back. She would want to hear everything that had happened to him in all those years. Could he remember them all? He would tell her about Nyoye and his mother and all about the locusts. Then quite suddenly a thought came upon him. His mother might be dead. He tried in vain to force that thought out of his mind. Then he tried to settle the matter the way he used to settle such matters when he was a little boy. He remembered a song. He sang it in his mind and walked to its beat. If the song ended on his right foot, his mother was alive. If it ended on his left, she was dead. No, not dead, but ill. It ended on the right. She was alive and well. He sang the song again, and it ended on the left. But the second time did not count. The first voice gets to Chukwu, or God's house. This was a favorite saying of children. Iki Mifuna felt like a child once more. It must be the thought of going home to his mother. One of the men behind him cleared his throat. Iki Mifuna looked back, and the man growled at him to go on and not stand looking back. The way he said it, sent cold fear down Ikimafuma's back. His hands trembled vaguely on the black pot he carried. Why had Okonkwo withdrawn to the rear? Ikimafuna felt his legs melting under him, and he was afraid to look back. As the man who had cleared his throat drew up and raised his machete, Okonkwo looked away. He heard the blow. The pot fell and broke in the sand. He heard Ikimafuna cry, My father, they have killed me, as he ran towards him. Dazed with fear, Okonkwo drew his machete and cut him down. He was afraid of being thought weak. Ugh, it's just so sad. From a narrative perspective, it's interesting for a lot of ways. Notice how Achebe cleverly shifts the perspective, and instead of seeing everything as an outside objective observer, we're looking at the world through Ikimafuna's head, all that back and forth, thinking about his mom and... This technique helps build the emotional climax. The death of Akimafuna is a turning point in the novel. The guardianship of Akimafuna was a mark of Okonkwo's high position in society. It marks his rise to power, but his involvement in his killing is the beginning of the decline. We're led to empathize with Akimafuna. We see his emotions, and we haven't seen much in, by way of emotions in this book, and we're not going to see a lot by way of emotions later on. Why did Okonkwo murder a child that he obviously loved? You know, you could think, well, you know, it's the respect for the gods, but I just read you where he beat his wife regardless of the gods. It doesn't seem like that matches his personality from what we know about Okonkwo. Well, he is rash, and he solves every problem with brute force, and that's really his go-to. And you don't see him engaging in a lot of dialogue. <laughs> no. He's unfeeling, even towards uh, the people that he loves. And for Okonkwo, words don't matter. Thinking almost doesn't matter. Only violent actions solve everything. This murder scene is set up in direct opposition to a feast that's going to happen next of the locusts, which are Chebe cleverly uses as a way to mark this ironic change. And let me show you what's working here. In the book of Exodus in the Bible, which would be a Western text that most readers would be familiar with, locusts are a plague and they come down and destroy the land of the Egyptians. But in Igbo culture, that's not what locusts represent at all. They're a good thing. Achebe, being raised in two cultures, raised as a Christian, knowing that his writers are mostly a Western audience, can play around with this double meaning of locus. The locus, in one sense, can foreshadow this future descent of the Europeans, the European understanding of locus, who are coming and are going to destroy. But the irony is that the local people celebrate locus. They don't know that it's coming. We know, and there's a lot of foreshadowing going on, which we haven't pointed them all out yet, but the locusts have descended, Omophia. But here, it's a joyful thing. It means free food. Everyone's excited. They're drinking wine. But then we have an awful murder. 
Aconquo's rash action is set up against the Igbo culture of great rhetoric and festivity. How important is dialogue in the culture? Well, we know it is. It's extremely important. Proverbs are the palm oil with which words are eaten. Umofia prides itself on its great rhetoric, but not Aconquo. He doesn't solve things with words. That will be a problem. <laughs> Next episode, we'll pick up here beginning in Chapter 8 and discuss the aftermath of this death-filled action. And uh, Konkwo has asserted his manliness, but really at what cost? And we'll answer that question in the next episode as well as explore more of the culture and faith of the Ubu people as it clashes with the outside forces of Christianity and colonialism. A lot more to talk about. So It's a busy, deep book. <laughs> it really is. Thank you for being with us. Uh, we appreciate your support. Uh, check us out on our social media. Follow us on our How to Love Lit podcast page and see all the great things we have there for teachers and educational resources. And above all, tell a friend. Even take a step farther. Text them an episode. Peace out. Summer.